All right, everybody, welcome to the Friday Mastermind. I always love this call because I'm connected with amazing people. I uh, saw something on social media today. Um, it was a little rant by Nick Saban, and he he said, you know, there's there's five types of of people out there. There's you know, like bad, average, um, bad, average, good, exceptional, and elite. And, and I, I just loved that. I thought it was so relevant to the mortgage industry today. It's so relevant to um, having R Renee Rodriguez as our special guest. Uh, he's going to be talking about leadership and influence. And I can tell you that the, the type of professionals and leaders that have been through his training are the ones that want to be elite and the ones that are elite, um, you know, people that, you know, aren't performing or they're average Guys, we're we're moving into an era in mortgage where there's going to be, you know, the haves and the have-nots. And and I do believe um exceptionalism, eliteness is, you know, the folks that are playing at that level are are going to have the just record-breaking year. So so an important call. I would say turn off your mobile devices, uh, really focus on today's content. And if you do that, you're you're gonna get a major gift. So uh Todd, it's not often, it's been a long time since it's been you, me, and Deborah leading this. But what's up, Mr. Books, man? You know, it's uh, it's great to have the whole crew together. It was normally you or I travel, and it's been Deborah who's been off on vacation, so good for her. You know, I'm uh, I'm fired up. I think leadership is so important, and I think that some of you are thinking, well, I'm not a leader. I don't lead anyone, but you do. You lead yourself. That's the most important. So when you talk about what what Nick Saban said, and you had sent me the, the graphic on it, I think it's just super important. Um, Deborah and I taught a class yesterday on launching the second half of 2023, and um, I wanted to start it off with the, the Kobe Bryant video that says, you know, did you get better today, right? Like, But I knew that YouTube then wouldn't allow me to repost it. But, you know, I think it's that whole idea of you got to be the best you every day, and you've got to lead it. And um, that's why I'm so excited for what Renee is going to walk us through. But before we bring him on there, we mentioned her, let's bring on none other than Deborah Bird. What's up, Deborah? You know, I think it's been a month since I've been on these Friday calls, so I'm excited to be back. I'm in a little bit different environment as we we moved into a, a temporary rental, thanks to my son flooding our house. But, you know, I agree. I think um, I had a discovery call and I had a client mention how they felt like they were in a sales depression. Um, units are down, volume is down, and that mental funk that you can be in and kind of beating yourself up. I don't think we always realize how that could be projected out when we are then meeting with clients or on the phones with agents. So I really feel that as we launch into the second half of this year, that this message is going to be one that you're going to want to send out to your teams. Even if it's your ops teams, if you're a branch manager, if you're in the C-suite, this is going to be one you want to share at your next sales meeting. I'm excited. All right, guys. So it's been a long time since we have Renee. Uh, he is in more demand than ever. He's got a best-selling book, Amplify. Uh, he's meeting with more leaders in the mortgage space than ever and outside the mortgage space. Uh, Renee, you picked this topic, you know, unleash success, how to sell, influence, and lead in stressful times. Um, you know, one, why did you pick that as the headline of today's mastermind? And, and then two, I'd love to just, you know, hear what you've been, you know, what you've been hearing and what you've been sharing out there in the marketplace. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's good to see all you guys again. And, you know, your, your consistency in this industry, there's so many people that count on just having this weekly injection of, of knowledge, of content, of reminders, of all that sort of stuff. And so it's always good to be back here. And, you know, so it's so fascinating. And you said it, Dave that this 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 time period is such an interesting time period in the sense that the what what I've seen is that there's people that have been what what I would call talkers for a long time they went through the refi boom and they had this unfortunate dose of non-reality that you could breathe and make money and that you could serve people poorly not follow up and not go through and just not and make a ton of money that is one of the biggest disservices, I think, to a human being there is, where you don't go through the work. And th the science behind that is fascinating. It's, it's what we call fake dopamine. And fake dopamine would be playing a video game. You know, kid comes in and says, I won the, the Super Bowl on Madden. No, you didn't. You moved buttons around and you didn't win anything. And 
you know, the, the, the participation trophies, all of that stuff's fake dopamine and the drugs are fake dopamine. And when we get this dose of dopamine that wasn't attained through difficulty and effort, which is what the science is now telling us, any dopamine attained that isn't through massive effort is not good for you. And so we have to go back and go, okay, hold on a second. Let's reframe, let's re set what was what's the word uh, level set on what reality is and any industry that you're in you're going to have to work your ass off to get a lead and to close a deal especially for the margins that, you, that, that the mortgage industry closes at in real estate and so that's not a bad thing that's actually a really really good thing but when we come off of that the contrast is so heavy you can feel heavier than it really should and so i think what what i want people to understand is that, that we can take some of that back and start reframing this market that we're in into saying, hold on a second, you know, and, and you, if I, I went through months of just telling people the analogies of no one's running, let's run, you can take, you know, the market share right now. And there are people that ran. But I'll tell you this, there's the talkers that aren't doing anything right now. And we've seen it in our business, you know, even uh, everything is slow. But that doesn't mean I'm not closing the biggest deals of my life, which I have in the mortgage industry. And and, I, and I'm going to, and I never share numbers. And Dave, have you ever heard me share financial numbers of any sort? No. Ever. I'm going to share one only for the sake of that there's still a massive amount of business. We closed a $1.3 million deal for three hours of my time per month and two days per quarter in a mortgage company. There's money, there's opportunity. There are people that are skyrocketing right now because they continue to run every day. They don't allow the language of, well, oh, this is a down market, whether it's down or not. The verbalization of that, that conversation changes everything in the human system and the narrative and the brain and the, what's happening. And they start seeing that. And that's the, this is the part where what I love the concept of, you know, you always know me for neuroscience, but my big passion right now is around vision science. Ooh. And when we get into vision science, you guys know Andrew Huberman, right? I and mean, you guys all know him. You know, he's love a vision him. scientist. He's not a neuroscientist. He's a vision scientist. That's what's so fascinating about him is that when we think about vision, you'd think, okay, my retina, my cornea, what I see, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things this way and, you know, closing one eye and 80, 20 vision or whatever the, the, you know, 20, 20 vision, but vision science is also what we visualize and the effects on the body and the effects on the brain and the effects on behavior and performance. And so what we verbalize turns into a vision, into a narrative that we visualize, and that starts to dictate how we behave and how we view the world. We've all seen the pessimist and the optimist. That's a simple age-old concept. But let's go back to the person that go, enters the market and says, this market sucks, and we're just trying to breathe, versus a person says, you know what? This is a great time. What's the difference between the two? The difference is, is what the person sees and how they see their reality. And then you have to say, okay, so then how do you construct that reality? You construct that reality through a narrative. And that narrative is formed by what we say. That is, that's the sequence. And that's if you start following the breadcrumb back around what can I control right now, you control what comes out of your mouth. And you have to understand that. And so like, you know, when, when and we go back, all of us, all three, all four of us here go back to the pandemic when it happened. And I told people, I said, I don't allow people, I never allow people to say coronavirus or, or COVID in our company. And why? Because what good would it do? Instead of just saying, well, when COVID happened, we just, and the, people's energy falls, their eyes fall. I mean, look at my, I'm, I'm here, combo, but when COVID happened and you see my body language shift and you don't think that people project that onto their clients. And the sad part and the hard part is that the moment you start talking that way, people gravitate towards it because of their negativity bias. They start gravitating. It's like, yeah, I know when COVID happened and all of a sudden it's like, we're in a party of negative. I, I want nothing to do with that. And if you're listening to this, move yourself out of a position or in, out of a group of people that might be speaking that way. You have to get out of that. And I, and I speak with this, this emphatic voice because it's something that is so critical. Our kids are growing up in this. I just, I'm just spending a lot of time with Dr. Oz and our conversation are all, the conversations are all around kids. His whole, his whole nonprofit right now is Health Corps, like the Peace Corps, but Health Corps. And how do you help kids now start seeing the world and being different? And it comes down to parenting. I did, I did another thing. This is, we were at, I was at a keynote last week, and I, I asked, I said, okay, how many people here are a little bit frustrated with the current um, generation and their work ethic? And 
I'll let this call it interesting. And they say, how many people are frustrated? It's like, yeah, they're a bunch of wimps or yeah, they're this, they don't work hard. I'm like, I know I'm frustrated too. And we all kind of had them. I let them all have a moment with that. And if you're a millennial or a generation Y or whatever, you're, you hang with me here. And I said, I know, isn't that crazy? I said, oh, I got another question. Who raised them? And all, all our hands went back up. And I said, see, we created them. I said, but how did we create them? I said, how many people in this room had a tough upbringing? All of us raised our hands. And I said, how many people vowed to work so hard that your kids would never have to go through what you went through? And they're like, yeah, me too. And I said, see, that's where we fucked up. Sorry for the language. It's the formula that created the work ethic and who we are and our grit to be able to go through things. And yet we sheltered our kids from all of that. I'm guilty of as well. I've had to go back to both of my kids and say, Alex, Diego, I messed up. And we've had this conversation going on four, five years now. And we came up with a term called manufactured struggle, manufactured adversity. I said, you know what? We're doing well, finally. And we had years of horrible. I said, but we're doing well. I said, and, and I go, and there are certain parts of life that you won't relive. And, you know, part of me is happy about that. But then, I, then I, now I know I'm actually sad about it. I said, so you're going to have to, son, and I teach them, and I talk to them about the science, I talk to them about the stories, and they start getting it. I go, you're going to have to manufacture some struggle. You have to manufacture some struggle for yourself. And they came to me as an issue, and I told my son, Alex, I said, I could write a check right now and solve this one for you. I said, but you will hate me if I do. And you'll feel under my thumb if I do. I said, or, or I can sit here next to you, and we can talk about it, and you can figure your way out of this mess. And I'll love you through it. And I'll be a guide. I said, but I'm not going to do it for you. And he said, dad, don't do it. And I was like, my boy, good boy. But I think when we look at that, I said, what does that mean to us? What it means to us is right now, we're in the middle of a struggle. And how many of our favorite speakers, our biggest leaders, our biggest influencers go back and talk about a struggle they went through and what they learned. And we all love them of that journey out. It's that hero's journey. Well, we're in that now. Shouldn't that be super exciting that we are right now living that? But it's when we're living that struggle, we forget that we're going to have a story to tell at the end of this. And we are also leading through this. Go back to what I did in the Lighthouse series. We said leaders are going to get called out. Leaders are going to get called out at the end of this for the ones that showed up and the ones that didn't. And it's the same as true. It's the, it's, it's the age of reckoning for poor leadership. So why do I share all of this? One, first takeaway. Manage what comes out of your mouth. Just start there and pay attention to it. I mean, literally just start paying attention to it. I, I talk to everyone about this. Men, women, gay, straight, doesn't matter. Black, white, any color, it doesn't matter. What comes out of our mouth starts to really turn into how we visualize and see the world and interpret the world, which then turns into our reality and how we perceive it. And then what follows that is our behavior. and magically, then results, either poor or good. And so if we can go back to, I always ask myself, what's the applied science here? The applied science would be manage what you say. And if we can manage what we say, and go back to Trevor Moab, remember him? Beautiful Absolutely. human being who passed away way too early. His number one message was don't verbalize the negativity. I'm so sad that he passed away because he was on the cusp of some really, really good stuff. And he was being recognized for that really good stuff. And he just said, you can think some of the negative thoughts, but don't say them. And he had all the research that showed once you say it, all the things that start to follow. And so, one, manage what you have to say. Surround yourself around people that are having great conversations because then people are talking about it. My, my rule is simple. If, if we're talking about other people, I'm out. No interest in that conversation. It's really, really simple. If we're talking about so-and-so in a negative, just, I'm out. Now, I might even agree, but I'm also, I'm out because it's tempting. I might agree, might get involved. I'm like, yeah, no, can you believe that they, and all of a sudden now I'm in, in this thing and I'm going to go, man, slap myself out, get out of this conversation. And it does take discipline. It's not easy because man, that conversation is super tempting, especially if you don't like that person. So manage what you say, manage who you're around right now, because that's going to manage your perception of the world. And then it's going to follow what your behavior is. You are all salespeople. You know how to sell. You've got to make phone calls, dial that phone call, talk to people, book appointments, give a beautiful presentation and explain who you are so they trust you. 
separate yourself from the rest and move forward to the next step in the sales process. It is fundamental and it will never change. If you're a great marketer, then you got to be able to tell a great marketing story, but you can't be a great marketer and a negative person because at some point that marketing is going to lead to a conversation. And if that doesn't match up, it's not there. What we want to have is, is, is a um, congruent validity. Well, congruent validity. When that happens, you're getting the same message from all angles. All those messages are coming from the same angle. I did a podcast with Neil Ford last week. It just, it just launched last week. And we were talking about that validity in marketing where you get the messages that are the same from all areas. That's how a brand starts to get formed. You hear the same message six times, seven times, seven different ways. And it's there, but you got to manage how you're saying, how you're acting, how you're behaving. So that's my initial rant. We can, we can get into this, but I don't want to stop. If you guys have any questions, I'm, I, I get overly well, I passionate about that stuff. Well, I can't. Let's all add a few thoughts. I can't wait to get into what you're going to share, but I do want to call out for everyone listening to this. You know, we're 15 minutes, 17 minutes into this conversation. Consider this the first quarter and, you know, mindset matters. All the most successful, happiest people I know, um, they're positive people and they're talking about positive things. And so I love, I love what you just shared, Renee, in terms of kind of setting the stage around that. Todd, anything you want to add to what Renee said or you want to call out? Well, I mean, we've always heard that, right? You're the you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And, you know, I always call it out, acknowledge you, Dave, right? For the last seven years, you know, you've been one of those five people that I spend the most time with, not necessarily face-to-face, -face, but talking to, conversing to, having those high level of conversations. And I feel like you all listening to this, you know, look around you because I do find that, you know, the how people say things, what people say, like I love Jonathan or the, I love uh, Renee that you call out that you didn't talk about COVID or the pandemic, right? Jonathan Roach always talks about the health situation, right? Is it, how are you, how are you showing up and who are you showing up with? And does that need a little bit of an upgrade? It's, it's been a hard one for me just because there's some people that uh, have been important in my life for a long time that I've had to spend less time with for those reasons. So I, I think, especially now when, uh, business is hard, right? It's not easy. Renee already pointed out, he just got a, a great contract because he's adding value to people. And, and I know the people in our industry who are adding value are adding real estate agent relationships and, and adding and, and, and being a positive life force. And I think that you've got that in you. You just got to look around you and see how that is. That would be my, my two cents in perspective. Beautiful perspective. Deb, anything you want to add before we bring Renee back in? Yeah, it, it's a self leadership, you know, it starts with yourself. And, you know, maybe it's, it's time that regardless if it's tough out there, are you trying to catch people doing the right things? Or are you just always focused on what they could be doing more of? So maybe make that more intentional, whether you're leading a team or you're doing sales meetings, which activities could you honor? And are you seeking the good and, and showing the good and verbalizing it and writing it. Cause I think that has kind of a chain link reaction and, and goes back to being the lighthouse. So, so before we bring Renee back in, I do want to call out um, your awesome shirt. Uh, <laughs> very cool shirt. Also want Thank to you. call out to everyone that you can get one of those shirts yourself on the wind by noon store. Uh, if you want to get the link, just go to savageinsights.com. And it's towards the bottom here. So very sweet shirt. Thank you for uh, helping lead the mortgage coach trust engine revolution. Love it. Well, 100% of the profit proceeds, everything from the sale of those shirts goes to First Home IQ. So no one's making a profit awesome. off of those shirts. We're just uh, giving you a conversation piece to wear around and do a good deed at the same time. Love well, let me it. tell you, when I wear this out, like I'll be at the airport or at the pool, I get people ask me all the time about what is a mortgage coach, or they'll ask me mortgage questions. So genius marketing idea, Dave. Boom. Yeah. Uh, we just, we just fell into that. But uh, so, so Renee, um, where do you, where do you want to take it here in the second quarter of this call? Well, I, I'm, one part I didn't mention around that contract that I got was it came from a client that I helped during their most difficult time in the beginning. Love that. Years ago, two years ago, year, year and a half to two years ago. And it's, it's one of those pieces that, you know, the, the, the impact that you have right now on people, when you, even when you don't get paid, is going to be something that lasts. And if you truly believe in that sort of that cycle of life and how that works, and right now you're probably going to be working with realtors that might not be able to help you right now, but you help because you can. 
That's the, that's our job. There's a great quote out there that says, you know what? When the flood comes, I want to be the one who built an ark. I want to be the one that works so hard on something that it builds some level of value and service to the world that when people are struggling, I can lend a hand in whatever way. Maybe it's financial. You can do something to do that. But Todd, did you? So speaking of lending a hand, Renee, I know you put a link for your master class in there. And I think anytime that Renee is taking time and in, in putting his effort, energy, brilliance into a class for all of us, especially a free class, we should sign up. So um, I want to encourage everyone to do that. What can we expect when we show up, Renee? Thank you. What well, you know, it's <clears throat> this has been this last year, two years have been a lot of transition for us. And part of it is, you know, watching uh, watching our brand and social media presence grow, but at the same time, also the need to look at how do we serve everybody and serve differently in the the process and, and you know been really around some really great people and, and been sort of nudged and saying how do you offer more free content and I've always wanted to be able to say whether you pay for me or we exchange money or not I want our interaction to be highly valuable and you know there's a lot of pro bono work that we do for the people that can't afford it we do it with the vets we do it with all sorts of people but we wanted to do something around our, the book uh and it would be a free masterclass. And obviously there's ways to continue beyond that. But whether or not you decide to continue, that masterclass is gonna be extremely, extremely valuable. And it is free, there's no catches to it. And so we, we're, we're gonna be offering a lot more of that type of stuff. And just learning more and more, the more that you give back, the more you, you're sharing. Man, I, I never get a chance to go to the depth of the work except for the people that work with us. So there's, there's no loss of, you know, there's no shortage of, of ideas and content. So it's it's fun to kind of keep it fresh, keep it alive. And I, I'm really excited about it. So sign up right there. There's the link. It's free masterclass. It's, uh, I forget the date, July something. It's coming up in a, uh, July just under two Yeah, I don't encourage uh, multitasking, but switch real quick, go sign up and then get right back here and start paying attention again. Yeah, it's it's easy and quick, guys. Just click there, put your name in. Uh, you you do have to put in the source, you know. Put, why don't you sign? Why don't you finish that registration, Dave, so we can see well, what it I, looks I just like. I just did. I already <laughs> I did it before I pulled this up. We'll see if it lets me do it again. Uh, click there and ba boom. Well, it took a second time, but I had already event? signed up. Is it a good event to bring our real estate agents to, Renee? Uh, this is a good event to bring your kids to. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, bring cool. your agents. Bring any referral partners. All the content we're doing, we are now, especially with the work we're doing with Oz, is really gearing towards how does everybody in all walks of life understand the role of influence? And if you think about it, go back to this, like, like go, go back to the opposite of influence. And who, who did I just have this conversation with? It, it, it's because somebody asked me why influence. And I said, well, think about it from this perspective. Influence is so much <clears throat> more than an offensive strategy for selling and closing more deals and being transactional. It's more than branding. This is about who you are in the world. And influence is saying, if you, if you don't have it, you walk in a room, no one notices. You tell a joke, no one laughs. You share an idea, no one cares. You, you cast a vision and no one follows. You sell a product, no one's buying. You feel, if you don't have influence, you feel invisible and you feel insignificant. If you were in a meeting and you felt invisible and insignificant, you'd ask yourself, why am I in this meeting? If you were in a relationship and you felt invisible and insignificant, you'd ask yourself, why am I in this relationship? The sad and the hardest part, the part that drives me the most is the last question, is if you were going through life and you felt meaningless, insignificant, and invisible, too many people ask themselves, why am I here? And so to me, influence is about answering that question, about your significance to the world that just so happens to have a beautiful value proposition message that can help you in business, which I believe business is serving the world in a different way through your gifts. But we have to start with who you are. And so if we can answer that question in a real way, now all of a sudden it takes off. And so that to me is it's really meant for everyone. Bring your realtor partners, host a host a viewing party, you know, do those types of things. Just let us know you're hosting a viewing party. We'd like everybody to register. And so um, yeah, thank you. Sweet. Um, <laughs> and 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 the deal is, you know, to you know, as I open this up, the five types of of people. The, the ones that are living at a level of excellence and elite, they have influence. You know, they've mastered that. And many of them have gone through Amplify and are part of Renee's tribe. So, Renee, where, what is, where are we going to take it from here now in this mastermind? So, what you, I, in fact, you were one of the first people I called about this next um, concept idea. And 
you know, we, we chatted about it. We hashed it around a little bit. We spent time, we came back, we chatted around it. I've shared this with some of the smartest people I know in, in, in the world. And it's been probably one of the most exciting conversations. It's actually at the core of what our mastermind group is about and how we approach things. But if you can, am I, am I spotlighted by chance? I don't know. Cause I'm going to turn to this camera. Yeah, we're going yeah, we, to actually do something, oh, boom. something here. We see Perfect. It. So <clears throat> well, I talked about this concept called VUCA and there is, there's no organization in the world that spends more money on leadership development than the U S military. And the reason, and I've, I've followed the U S military since the beginning of my career going on 30 years, because there's something about the U S military that they, one, look at what they have at stake. One, it's our security. One, they're sending human beings into a foreign country. Typically their lives are at stake. Our security is at stake. There's so many things on the line. And so they have to understand the world in which they live. <laughs> and in the 80s, they brought together some of the biggest thinkers. Warren Bennis was one of them. And they said, we need to understand the world that we're in. And we, right now, like we have to be able to infiltrate. We have to be able to fight. We have to be able to create change in this world. And back then, they came up with an acronym called VUCA. And VUCA is the acronym for, at the time, was a volatile world. It was middle of the Cold War. This is the 80s. You didn't know if something was going to blow up. Was, where are we going to go back to war? People had their fingers on the trigger, on the, on the buttons. We didn't know, know what was happening, which made it a very uncertain time. And so you're looking at this uncertain time that was also extremely complex to understand and became also ambiguous. And so if we look at, if you imagine, you're about to send people into war in a place that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Do you think that would have an impact on how you train them? Do you think it'd have an impact on how you'd, how you'd recruit, who you'd have, what, what, what tools you'd give them, how you would lead your messaging? I mean, it goes on and on. And so this became something that really grabbed a hold. And what happens in, with the military and their leadership strategies is that U.S. business begins to follow shortly after. And U.S. business started saying, okay, hold on. So we live in this VUCA world. What does that mean to how we market? What does it mean to how we manage? What does it mean to how we lead? What does it mean to how we sell and influence and do all the things that an organization needs to do in a VUCA world? And that started really, truly affecting strategy. And a few years ago, and accented by the pandemic, what the big thinker started to say is that VUCA isn't sufficient enough to explain the world that we live in now. And so I'm not putting a line through it, but I'm, what I am saying is that it's not sufficient. I'm not saying that we don't have volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We do. What I'm saying is that it's not sufficient. And so they got together and somebody offered a different acronym. And this acronym, I'm going to do the color, let's go with. Uh, B or red here, Banny, B A N I. And so <clears throat> here we are, where before volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And before I, I give you these, I want to, I kind of want to preface them a little bit, frame, if you will. As I explain these to you, when they were explained to me, I, the first thought that went through my mind, it, it, it made sense. It, it explains so much of my frustration. It explains so much of my confusion, it explains so much of why we need to take different approaches. And with a lot of the clients that we deal with, they're dealing with billion dollar issues that they have to take things that are much further than a transactional approach to something. And, and I want to say something with love to the industry here. I have a lot of courses that I offer that I never bring to the mortgage industry, Engage being one of them, leadership and strategic planning being another one. And the reason is that the mortgage industry is very transaction focused. Most decisions are made based on how many loans will those help me get? Well, I can only, if I, I do two more loans and I can pay for this. How are we going to recruit somebody that brings more production? Everything is about volume and production. And so many decisions are made that way. And the people don't think about long-term planning. They don't think about career path. The career path isn't a, isn't a conversation. It's not even something that happens in colleges. People don't say, well, do you want to grow up to be more? There's not even a box to check. Yeah. And the, the transaction focus, what it turns into is people don't think long term enough. Look at the hires, the massive hires and the massive firing that happens based on transaction volume. It plagues the industry. And there are a few companies out there that are thinking further. They think differently. 
some of them are disliked from, from people might be because they're doing really good things and or maybe because they're winning. But the point being is that I want you to start thinking beyond the transaction and start thinking of a career. One of the first lessons Zig Ziglar gave me is to stop thinking about making a sale and start thinking about making a career. And that means sometimes saying no. And I remember being 18 years old, hearing that and saying, okay, so sometimes I've got to say no. So it was so moldable at that time to think beyond this sale and to think for the further down the path, that long-term vision. And so what I'm going to show you with Banny really speaks to Wayne Gretzky's quote. We all know it. Don't speak, skate to where the puck is. His big secret was skate to where the puck is going to be, right? Where it's headed. And so this is where the puck has been. This is where we're headed. And we're kind of in it right now. And so I want you to think about it from that perspective and how this, and, and I want you to listen to this and don't get caught up in politics when I bring this up. Because yes, it has political implications, but guess what? We have all been trained to get highly mo emotional around the political conversation so that they can control a moment in time where we vote. Don't get caught up in that. I want you to step back and I want you to think bigger for a minute. I want you to think broader. Think for the next five to 10 to 15 years of your life and your career, because we're all going to, hopefully we're all going to be here during that time. The question is, will we have behaved and will we have thought long-term enough to do that? So maybe make sure as you hear this, step back and think about how we could do this. So hey, we, the first quick, one, Renee, Renee, please. before you jump in and please. unleash this. So, I mean, this really is a moment that you guys need to stop multitasking. And if you are, and I'm, I'm taking notes. So if you do see me looking down, it's just putting pen to paper um, and, and really embrace this. You know, Renee first shared this with me, I think it was a little over a month ago. And I would tell you two months ago, and I, I will tell you, this has been really powerful. You know, that now it's it's almost like you have this decoder. Things are happening in the mortgage industry. It's a great and way I'm to, able put to it. decode them. Uh, things are happening in our world, and I can decode them. So what he's going to share is something that's that's going to help explain um, the world that we live in today. It's going to help you um, cope with some of it. Some of it's just when you can understand something, you can, you know, it gives... It, it takes away the anxiety and the stress. And then as a leader and as an innovator, you can't innovate if you don't understand the, the game, the game that you're being playing. And guys, this is the game that's being played in America, in the world, in mortgage, in housing. So um, pay close attention to this and um, re-listen to this. And for the, you know, the mortgage coach innovation team, let's create some micro content around this and really um, help educate the industry around this. So, Renee, unleash mm -hmm. Banny. Uh, well, thank you. I loved how you said that. That's a decoder. That's a really, really, really brilliant way of thinking about this because I've understood VUCA for almost 20 some years. And that was sort of, it's like there's certain things that I hold on to really closely that are, I see almost competitive advantages or they're cheat codes to understanding things. And and they allow you to make broader decisions that have an impact that are really hard for people to pinpoint why it works versus why something doesn't work. And I think this is one of those. And, and the excitement in sharing this is I want, I want it to create intrigue and I want you to study this. But what you'll find when you start studying this, that they speak at a very global level. One of my, I guess one of the things that I'd say makes me unique in why neuroscience is, is my ability to take that sort of nerdy complexity and bring it down to the concept of what I call applied science. And so I want to bring this, uh, this applied lead, thought leadership, if you will, to an applied level. But let me give you at least a, a 10,000 foot view of what that looks like. And then let's let the conversations begin, because that's where it gets to be a lot of fun. And so um, let me get my, my face in. Zoom. Wait, 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 wait. There we go. We got it. All right. So the first word is the one that hit me the hardest, is that I want you to think of the world that we're in for a minute. Think about back in the day, for those of us who are older, those who are younger, hang with me for a minute. When people would call us a name, what would we do? You might fight and put up your dukes, and you might fight it out, or you might yell and scream about it, but then it was over. It was a name. When something happened and your team didn't want win, you just lost. I remember knowing that there were tryouts for a team and getting cut from the team, knowing that not everybody made it. 
you got cut. And if you got a trophy, you were either first place, second place, or third place. That's what it was. And think about right now, when we say the wrong word on Instagram, on social media, when we say the wrong things, the big C word comes out and we get canceled. There's a lot of that stuff going on right now. And so what they're saying is that we live now in a brittle world. In a brittle world that, if you think of brittleness, brittleness is one, and, and I, I, do, I do a lot of thinking and the symbolism behind br brittleness. I've looked at a lot of the philosophy behind brittleness and why that word was chosen. And brittle seems strong on the surface until it's put under any pressure. And think about how much of it does it break. Not some of it, but all of it crumbles. And so we live in this brittle world. When the easy one is to go to, we, we have more brittle feelings. And there's a lot of more sensitivity, which, by the way, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a highly sensitive person. I'm more feminine in my personality traits uh, in, in that sense. I cry at movies. I, I get very, I was crying just earlier talking about what was happening and, and the importance of this, literally two minutes ago. And so it's... It's the oversensitivity and the extreme of anything I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of. Extreme politics, not a fan of. Extreme anything I'm not a fan of. And, but this brittleness of our grit, of our work ethic, but then also the brittleness of the, of the U.S. dollar, the brittleness of our economy. I mean, what, what's going on here? And so think about that concept of how brittle some things are right now, which le leads to also a lot of anxiety. We're in an anxious world. So here we have two really powerful worlds. And if you think about this from the perspective of the era that we're in, another word for that is zeitgeist. The era, if we're in a brittle and anxious world, are we going to have World War III? Is, is the pandemic going to happen again? What's going to happen is, 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 is there's so many things that, that, that cause this level of anxiety. Interest rates, are they going to go up? Are they going to come down? Am I going to lose my business? What's going on? And this next one is fascinating to me. And this probably, this is probably the hardest one to understand. It's we're in a nonlinear world. And this nonlinear nature, what it comes down to is understanding that used to be that things were, were very linear. This caused this. It was causality between two, two events. This happened, which caused this. And it allowed for futurists to predict. It allowed for people to to kind of, you know, economists to, to really, really say, well, this is what's going on and we could predict. And, but now it's so impossible to predict what's going to happen next because it's nonlinear. I mean, go back to what happened where we had uh, a few storms, crops were, were, were blown away, storms in the sea, which left. And then somebody, uh, the pandemic happened, which caused people to buy toilet paper, which used up all of the specific cardboard that w went within rolls of toilet paper. And that specific cardboard was also used on the inside linings of Pringles boxes. And Pringles boxes then all of a sudden pulled on the fact that uh, the tin can opening pieces there was in abundance. And with this storm in the, in the sea that now these ships were stuck at, 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 um, in the bay and they couldn't come in. And all of a sudden now we're, we don't have avocado. It's like, <laughs> what? Like, and all of that stuff, now, I made a lot of that stuff up, but that's, if you follow those pieces, that's how nonlinear a lot of these things feel. And so how are you supposed to function when you realize that one thing could cause this, this, this domino effect on things that don't make any sense, which comes to the last one, which I think wraps all of it together. We're brittle, anxious, nonlinear, but we live now in an incomprehensible world. And this part, this incomprehensible nature where, and Dave, you sent me a really good post, I think it was yesterday, that I want to just read because it was, it was so good of capturing the incomprehensible nature of where we're at right now. And so um, if you don't mind, do you mind if I read that? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not taking your thunder. You, it was your, your, your thing here. But it was talking about what's happening currently right now. and. When you look and you hear this list, I mean, it's, this, is, this is weird. Like, whoever, who would have ever thought, number one, that the U.S. dollar wasn't the global currency? Or that would even be questioned. Who ever thought that a flu could shut a nation down and countries down? And I, I can go further on a bunch of stuff that I can't even mention right now. But the national debt hit a high, record high of $32 trillion, okay? National debt. Global pandemic finally declared over. 
three of the four biggest bank failures happened. The stock market entered a bull market. <laughs> what? Okay, how are we going to have those at the same time? Life expectancy now hits at the lowest point in decades. Apple becomes the first tri $3 trillion company. Okay, affirmative action was declared unconstitutional. Unemployment hits the lowest level in 54 years. And a former president indicted for the first time. Possibly going to do. And is now, and then go add to that, his, his, his approval ratings are higher than ever. What world do we live in? And so now I, 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 <laughs> I have fun going through that from not a judgmental place, but from a fascination. And that's what I want to get you to, is to be fascinated with this. Because what this tendency in this, and I've, I've, I've presented this with already in the last three months, thousands of people, thousands of people on stage have put this through. And the first most common response I get is, yeah, people are brittle and they need to toughen up. I'm like, no, stop, 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 stop. I also agree with that, but stop, that, that's not going to help. It's not going to help because you also have to have self-awareness. And this is the hard part. One of the self-awareness pieces is that when I start talking about previous generations, I'm no different than our parents saying, well, the music from the 90s was the best music in the world. Music today just sucks. Okay, Grandpa. Right? Well, that's me. I, that's how I feel. But if I'm not self-aware, I'm going to sound like my parents. And so I, I got to stop and go, okay, there is a balance between the old and the new. And if we were to Venn diagram them, there's a middle intersection between there. And that's why I got to live. I got to figure out, I got to bring the wisdom of the old and being the refreshing nature of the new. There is something there. And that's where we have to live. If you are on either side, you're losing right now. And I want you to, I want you to really take a good hard look in the mirror, remove your ego and say, am I extreme on any one of these? And if so, maybe I need to rethink my strategy. I got to be in, I got to be in this Venn diagram. And if you don't know what a Venn diagram is, is let's just think about it real simply. We've got the old and we've got the new, right? We got to live in here. We got to understand that there's value on both sides. We got to figure out what this looks like, right? That's where our leadership needs to come into play. This isn't a doom environment, but yes, there are some really crappy things going on. This isn't like, hey, everything's hunky-dory. No, it's tough, but you, know, but you know what? There are some really great things that are happening. And so it's, there is this beautiful place in there. And if we think about VUCA and Bani, there's a middle ground in here. If we think about the old school and the new school. There's, some, there's a middle ground in here where I think the truth lies somewhere. There's another great quote that says, run from those, or follow those who seek the truth, but run from those who claim they found it. Those are the scariest people right now, the ones that are certain about what's going on. And certainty is one of the, one of the key factors of the lack of intelligence, by the way, as studied by Harvard. Because what happens with certainty, when you're certain about something, you just cut off all possibility of other ideas. The smartest people in the world say, hey, this is what I know, and I put a lot of effort in this, but I've been wrong many times, and I might be wrong again, what do you got? And all of a sudden, the conversation ensues, and it's a much better conversation. And so when we're looking at all of this, VUCA, and Banny and where we're at. And you got to get past this emotional play of wanting to dive into this and say, okay, so what does this mean? What does this mean? That's a great question. What in the hell, Renee, do I do with this information? And that's the question should be going. But I'm going to pause there. We can go into that next. If I want to make sure I open it up for a great team here. If you guys have any questions, any comments, insights on what I've well, said so far. I want to make sure we have time to get into, you know, how do we turn this into action? So Todd, any quick thoughts or questions before Renee does that? No, I mean, it's just brilliant, right? I mean, all, all Renee's trying to do is encourage you to step back and think about this and think and act differently. And, and I uh, think it's a huge gift. So thanks, Renee. Deborah, anything you want to add? The only thing I would add is that now he's brought this to our awareness. So you're forced to do something with it, either ignore it and pretend like some of these things aren't going on. Are you being extreme in the old or extreme in the new? Um, so I'm ex excited to hear how to then put this into action because I'm sure everyone listening is thinking, hmm, I'm a little of this. I'm a little of that. Now, what do we do, Renee? <laughs> so Renee, before you do it, I want to wrap around a key concept and everything is accelerating, guys. You know, like the pace of change in the world right now is accelerating. Like here, here's a stat um, that just came out. It hit my feed um, that, you know, the time it's taken 
previous platforms. You know, we live in a platform economy to reach a million users. Um, Netflix, it took three and a half years for Netflix to have a million subscribers. It took two years wow. for Twitter. It took 10 months for Facebook. It took two and a half months for Instagram. It took five days for chat GBT. And I don't know how many of you guys have already signed up for thread. It took an hour and a half for thread to get to a million. And, and it, it went to 30 million overnight. And I use that as just a point to make guys change is happening. Um, you know, I do not believe, you know, the machine is going to take out local referral based human beings, but, but I do believe that, you know, that local referral based humans that understand Banny, they operate around the concepts and the influence that Renee talks about that leverage technology in that Venn diagram in the middle are taking market share and it's happening faster than ever. You know, I interview enough top producers that it's accelerating. So Banny's important and everything's accelerating. Renee, how do we take action? Uh, it did. That's such a good stat. I, I, Three people told me to a day and a half ago to start with threads and I uh, uploaded it up, did a couple of pieces. I'm over 13, almost 14,000 followers, like in a day and a half. It, 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 this is an opportune time for people to start learning how to adopt and play with this. I love it because I never could, I could never could understand and get with Twitter and I'm trying to, and I know some of the best thinkers do, and I've just never could wrap my head around it. And this feels like a restart. It feels like a, a new chance to really dive into something new and fresh and unique and so I'm trying to also think, okay, how can I leverage this? And my, what's funny is that the tendency is me to go copy videos that I did on all my other platforms and just paste it over there and just replicate, you know, so I look like a robot across all three. And I'm trying to force myself to not post videos and pictures and just start thinking there. And so um, that's my sort of what I'm putting myself through as the mental hurdle of saying, I'm going to really start thinking on this platform. And so I urge you guys to get on there, follow anybody you like, anybody you like listening to and engage and do all this stuff, but also start putting your thoughts out there. What a great way to get reps, right? You I, go to the gym to get reps in. This is a great way to get reps in thinking. And the beautiful thing about, <clears throat> and somebody was telling me, well, you know, your followers and likes don't matter. I said, well, I, I know that they don't, they're not everything. You don't need a ton of them, but it is a cool scoreboard for yourself. It's a way of people saying, does this resonate or not? And there's a ton of my posts that people just don't like. Like, I know there's a, there's a certain topic that my audience doesn't like. And my audience doesn't like sales topics for me for some reason. I go into sales. I love, I think I'm a good sales trainer, but it doesn't really go. But then all of a sudden I start talking about influence of body language and parenting. And all of a sudden it goes through the roof. And so I'm, I got to start listening to that. It's a way of checking the board. And I'm not saying the quantity. I'm just saying in percentage wise, what is giving you some data and some information and what people are voting on for you? Because your audience is constantly voting on your content. And if you're not, and people ask me, Renee, wow, that was overnight. I said, no, I'm 12 years into content creation. And when we started this new formula, it is a daily review. We are reviewing every post daily, daily. Within minutes of it going, we are reviewing it. And what's happening and what's going on. It has become a full department in how we look at it. And we turn this off. We're at a million followers on TikTok. And now we're at 191,000 followers on Instagram. And it grows every day. But bad content. You watch the followers drop good content, it goes up. And so I'm looking at that, not from the perspective of that, but what do people like? And that really helps me hone in on what's happening in the world. So let's go into what we do. And so we're talking about this VUCA, Banny, brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and comprehensive world. So I sat, this is where I, I sit with this, and I'm out of focus again, where I sit with this and say, okay, what the hell does this mean? And as I saw about this, I kind of bunched these together in two buckets to make it simple, to make it comprehensible, right? And what I'm gonna share here isn't either new either, but I think it's a reminder of a reinforcement of something that we all are very familiar with. In a brittle, anytime you're around brittleness or anxiousness, to me, this right here is now become more important than ever, your emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence first, was made popular back in 1995, Daniel Goleman. It was invented by Peter Salovey, even years, years before that. And, I, and the reason why I know that is because when my mother was doing this kind of work, I remember in 1995, we had like 20 packages sent to our house 
when in on the cover of Time magazine, it says, what's your EQ? And it was the all the rage. Daniel Goleman just wrote his book, Emotional Intelligence. And everyone's saying, Magali, you've been doing this work for years. And I remember as a kid watching this and now you know, watching sort of the, the, the adoption of EQ and the understanding of emotional intelligence sort of rise and rise and rise. Also, the misunderstanding of it. But, you know, Dave, Dave and I talk about this is that when when I have something that I think is really groundbreaking or something that's really critical, I try to employ the law of silence for a while with it. And it's one of the things Dave is such a great communicator on social media. That you, and he's such a fast disseminator of information that sometimes I gotta go, Dave, promise I'm gonna share something with you, but please don't <laughs> post about this just yet. And I didn't, I didn't post that, about this. I know, I was really proud of you. I was really proud of you. It was and, hard. And I go, um, but it's, the reason is, is that there's something, there's something about the law of silence that really helps us hone in on a concept deeper. And this, the, the research supports it too. Right now, do you know the research says that, you know, we used to think, I know I grew up thinking that the more public I get with my goals, the more I'm going to be held accountable. And so we go on social media, hey, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do this. And I've said it publicly. Well, the research shows that the moment you go public with what your goals are, the odds of you achieving it go way down. And the reason is, is the fuel to achieve and to go through the struggle of achieving a goal is this thing called dopamine. Dopamine is secreted in, not in the, as a reward, by the way. People think it's a reward hormone. It's not. It is secreted in the anticipation of reward. So it's, it's the cheerleader along the way. It's the thing that says, wow, I see the vision. I haven't gotten there yet. And dopamine kicks you in the ass and goes, you got this. And you go, man, think of dopamine, your favorite food. You see it. You haven't eaten it yet, which should be the reward. But as you look at it, you go, man, that looks good. And all of a sudden, that's a dopamine hit in anticipation. And so what happens is, is we go public with our goals. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, man, dude, that's great. You're going to write a second book, Renee? Man, that's so cool. Man, you're going to go do X. And why? Well, I, haven't, I haven't told anybody. I have a fitness goal I haven't told anybody about. I haven't told anybody about it. Not, and I'm even hesitating even saying that. Because I don't want any dopamine yet. I want none until I've done it. And I want the vision of it. I don't want people, because what happens is people say, hey, you're, you're going to write a second book. Oh, that's all. Dude, hey, Renee's writing a book. I'm getting all this dopamine and I haven't done the work yet. And all of a sudden, dopamine falls down below baseline. I don't have the energy to go do it. And all of a sudden it's there. And so the law of silence to me, sometimes the ideas that I have that I bring to stage, I'm with for two to three years before I bring it there. For me, why? Because when you're on a stage, you are scrutinized to another level. It's not just being a public speaker. You are publicly scrutinized where every word that you say. And I have been through too many times where I wasn't, I didn't do my due diligence on a concept or an idea. And I didn't go through and say, okay, I wasn't ready for that question. But when you spend time on something and you really pull it in and you don't cheapen the idea by just blasting it out to everybody and then all of a sudden it loses its effect that's why we hold on to these things and so i want you to, to eq has been one of those things that's super important to live but we hear it so often that it can almost we have built a callus to it i want us to sort of reopen that and what i'm doing right now is called qualifying a cliche i'm trying to reinvigorate an idea that is old but yet still fundamental it's no different than going to a personal trainer and saying hey i want to lose weight and the trainer says well, what we're going to do look at what you ate what you eat and what you're, how you're working out. And they go, well, you know, yeah, I've heard about that. I want something new and fresh. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, there's no, nothing new and fresh when it comes to getting in shape. It's about calories in versus calories out. It's kind of how it works. These are a deficit or a, uh, an abundance of it. And so EQ, we have to understand this. Now, here's where, what, what happens, is, though, is that most of us lose our EQ when we start seeing people who are brittle and anxious. We start pushing them when we shouldn't. We start imposing our ideas and our beliefs when maybe we haven't understood what's going on. And so for EQ, there are three things that need to happen. First is self-awareness. It's the first one, meaning how am I feeling right now? In a situation, I'm triggered, which I hate that word. God, I hate that word. But yet say something triggers you and you're, you start to get upset. Well, one, are you even aware that that's happening? Or are you um, oblivious? to the fact that the way you're behaving is affecting people. And so one is the self-awareness. How am I feeling? To be able to accurately identify, and Dave, you say it all the time, if you can name it, you can tame it. Are you able to name the emotion that you're feeling? And I tell people, start with four emotions, mad, sad, glad, scared. Mad, sad, glad, and scared. Are you able to name the emotion? Well, I'm mad right now. Well, I'm frustrated. Well, nobody really knows what frustrated means. Only you do. I'm disappointed. Well, 
Okay, is this point it's sad and angry? Scared? Which one is that? I don't even know. But mad, everybody knows. Sad, glad, and scared. They all know. And so one, start with some self-awareness. How am I feeling in this? Second, we need empathy, which would be how am I affecting others? How are they feeling? This is critical in speaking. You got to understand your audience. You got to understand how they're feeling, what they're going through. And you got to, before you start to speak, you got to understand what's happening. It's akin to going on a golf course and grabbing your favorite club before you even take a look at the hole and the pin where the pin placement or where there's a water hazard or if there's sand or how far it is. You have your favorite club, you grab the dri your driver, you get to the putting green. People are like, oh shit, wrong club. Well, some people swing it anyways. No, 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 no. Put the tool down. Assess the situation. Who, who am I dealing with? Is it men? Is it women? Underserved markets? Overserved markets? What's, what, what, who am I dealing with? And now, what's the issue? How am I feeling? Am I affecting people? Am I coming in? Am I oblivious? Or what, what, what's going on? If I have some self-awareness and some empathy, now I can assess, a, truly assess a situation. And the third part is a disciplined skill set to adjust myself to best meet the situation. That is the simplest way to understand emotional intelligence. It's self-awareness, empathy, and self-discipline. And so when we look at that now, most of us are pretty frustrated with what the, how the world is right now. But that frustration is not going to help you unless you cause change with it for yourself. And the best way to do it is to understand it and turn that frustration, as Jim Rohn would always say, into fascination. Turn that frustration into fascination. One of the best, man, pieces of advice I've ever heard. And so now we're looking at EQ. We got to be smarter. We got to be more emotionally intelligent. We got to be able to listen more and we're more empathetic. But now we got to go into nonlinear and comprehensible. And I'll give you three things that are critical right now. And I'm going to give you a little secret. They ain't new. We have to be better than ever at managing change, driving innovation, change, innovation. And what was my third one? I have a third one. I forgot it, but it's going to come back to me. I don't know why I'm having a, uh, a brain meld right now, but just change and innovation. If we look at that, just being able to manage change in our life and to be more innovative. So there's a, there's a key with innovation and change. Change is going to be a personal process. It's a stressful one. Most of us resist change. And, you know, if we look at this change and the nonlinear, we have to be more open-minded, right? That might be, I think that was another one, right? We have to be more open-minded than ever. And I say this as somebody who isn't real, I don't really like some of the new ideas that are happening in the world, but I have to have principles and standards that, that supersede my emotional state. And that would be something that I've, I've really been learning a lot from a, a dear friend, Ben Newman, is he's, he's coming out with this book called The Standard. And it's launching here pretty soon. I'm going to be part of his mental toughness forum with uh, Andy Frasilla, Ed Milet, uh, John Gordon, and you can just like 50 other just incredible people. Talk about mental toughness. It's actually a free event. Um, and he talks about, he's also using that to launch his book called The Standard. But The Standard is having a personal standard that, that supersedes my emotional state. Yeah, I don't want to get up in the morning, but I live by a standard and you get up in the morning. Yeah, I wanted to eat that food, but I live by a standard that won't let me do that. That is at the core right now. What's helped me even in my physical and, 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 and health journey is understanding that I have a standard now. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. And so, the standard for me is that I, I want to be open-minded in the times that I want, that I feel least open-minded. And that, that is like, and that is a tough one because when you, when things are great and everything's great, I can be, open, I'm super open-minded until we're not. But what if we're highly stressed? It's harder to be that. And so that's where these begin to clash. So I want you to look at this. This is what's fascinating. What do you think hates change and innovation and open-mindedness? Anxiousness and brittleness hate these things. So the solution is eating itself and fighting against itself. I'm supposed to be open in a world that doesn't want to be open. I'm supposed to be changing in a world that doesn't want to change. But maybe, this is where the hard part comes in. Maybe I'm the one that's supposed to change. And that's the hard question. Maybe I'm not supposed to change the world right now, but maybe I'm the one that needs to do a little changing. Shit, that sucks. But here's the thing, we don't know. I don't know the answer, but I got to be open to it. I'm going to be open to whatever the truth is. And sometimes I don't get a chance to decide the truth. I, put a, I, I had this feeling, this, this um, 
this thought this morning and I threw it on threads and I said that I refuse to live in a world that has that it forces truth to apologize. And I, I don't want to live in this world or succumb to a world that truth has to apologize. And I also don't want to run from it. And so there's a lot of stuff that's happening here. And you got to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, who, who are you? And if you can do this, let go of your ego. And this is a hard one. And if you don't understand ego, Google it. Chat GPT it. We have an ego. It serves a purpose for us. And it, and it definitely does not like to change. And it does not like to admit it's wrong. But if you can do that by yourself, and if you have a faith, I think that the, the self-reflection without ego is the highest form of any sort of prayer there is. It was also written in, the, in some story back in the day about somebody built the world in six days and rested one. At the end, he asked himself, did he, did he do good today? And if he did, he rested well. That is self-reflection. So I think we all need to reflect on who we are, who we've been, and who we want to be. And if we look at that, no matter what you believe, I think those are three really good questions that can guide us to some level of truth. But at the very least, it might make us a little bit more tolerable in a world like today. Such a powerful, right such a powerful lesson and masterclass, guys. You know, EQ, change, innovation, open mindedness. You know, those are kind of the closing thoughts of today's session. And that if if we want to be, you know, whether that's elite, you know, you truly want to be the best of the best in this banny economy, this banny market. Um, these are the things that we need to grow you know, personally and organizationally, you know, the CEOs, the leaders of teams that can embrace and create cultures of high EQ, cultures of innovation um, with open-minded folks. This is the future. Todd, closing thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I got stuck at the end on the, on the standard. Like, I love that. Deborah and I talked about that when we were teaching yesterday's, so you got to have a personal standard. And so I think that you should uh, you're all here. You all invested time, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching the recording of this. So, you know, first off, I would absolutely encourage you to um, be registering for Renee's masterclass. So if you haven't done that, you know, make sure um, that you do it. The link is going to be in the in the notes and is also in the chat. So make sure that you're registering for that. And then I think the other thing is, is really, you know, do that self-reflection. Um, go back and rewatch this and then figure out how in this um, new world of Bainey, how you can show up differently. Um, I love our community. I love all of you and, and want nothing but success for you. But I think you're all going to have to uh, dig in and do a little work uh, here in the second half of the year. And and uh, we're here to help you along the way. Yeah. Love it. Renee talked about, you got to do the work. You know, this is the market. Make sure you do sign up for that. Deborah, any closing thoughts from you? No, I just wrote on a sticky that I'm going to keep on my monitor of, did I do good today? And then I added to that, did I see good in others? And so that's mm. going to be my new sticky, my little mental note to constantly see good in myself and to, to do good, but also point out the good in others as well. Love so that. Thank you, Renee. Renee, awesome. thank you, brother. Love that second any, question. Any closing thoughts for you, brother? That's it. I just, I, I hope uh, people know I'm trying to come from a place. I, I'm, I, I didn't smile much today. I've been smiling much lately because I think I'm just getting more and more serious as I get older. <laughs> But uh, I, I think that today, that this time is such a critical time for all of us. And I think there's a beauty in adversity. There's a beauty in difficult times because we get a chance to know who we are. We get a chance to know what matters to us. And we get a chance to build a story. You're going to tell a story at the end of this. Ask yourself, what story do you want to tell? I used to tell my kids, they were saying, Dad, should I go do this and do that? And I go do the stupid thing over here. I said, you know what? I can't decide for you. But tomorrow, what do you want to tell me that you said that you did? We got to start thinking from that perspective in the future and backwards and saying, what do I want to manufacture today that I get to tell you in the future? Do I want to say that, you know, dad, I did the stupid thing. Well, no, I don't want to say that. Well, then do the right thing now. Well, what do I want to say at the end of this? That I, that I cried my way through it and I babied my way through it and I complained or did I lead my way through it? I hope that's an easy answer. I really hope that's an easy answer for you. We need more leaders at all levels and God bless this community for you guys continually always showing up for everybody, no matter what's going on with the latest stuff. It's an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. All right. And if you're watching this in YouTube, all the links that have been called out, they'll be down below in show notes. Uh, super grateful for you, Renee, brother. Thank you for an amazing Thanks, guys. masterclass. I hope everybody in this community 
everybody that watches this video, the way you say thank you to Renee, follow him on all of his social media platforms. If you haven't bought his book and read it, read it, do it. But guys, come to this masterclass, sign up. It's easy to do. Amplify your influence. And influence is the currency of this banning economy that we're in. Take care, everybody. Thank you.